By the end of this explainer, viewers should have a solid understanding of these key concepts. In this hands-on exercise, we're going to delve into the inverted calendar spread. This strategy involves buying a relatively cheap short-term option and selling a more expensive longer-term option. It's particularly useful when you anticipate not only a significant price movement in the underlying asset over the short term, but also an increase in volatility. Let's grab a pen and paper to break apart this strategy and understand all the details. Firstly, draw a horizontal line to represent the stock price, and a vertical line for the call premium. Label the x-axis as the stock price and the y-axis as the call premium. Next, draw a line at the strike price, K. Let's say it is $100 for this example. Draw another line for the stock price. For the purpose of our exercise, let's consider it to be $120. To keep it simple, let's consider the payoff at expiry. The payoff is the difference between the stock price and the strike price, also known as the intrinsic value. Calculate the intrinsic value at K equals $100 and S equals $120, and mark a dot, representing call price at this point. Repeat this process for K equals $100 and S equals $110. Now, plot a dot for the call price. If we connect these dots for a range of stock prices, we get a payoff diagram, which we'll show in white. But before maturity, the payoff curve doesn't look like a straight line, it looks more like a curve. In the next slides, we'll explain why this is the case. Now, we'll focus on how the call option price, which is the sum of the extrinsic and intrinsic value, is determined. Note that we're focusing on the curve of the call price rather than the payoff at expiry. Factors such as volatility, time remaining until expiration, and others contribute to the extrinsic value portion of the call price. The calculation of the extrinsic value is determined by a formula that we will dive into in greater detail. To start, Let's understand D1 and end one For this, we need to grasp the concept of the standard normal distribution, which is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. First, let's plot it. Draw the axis and label the standard deviations on the x-axis. The shape of the standard normal distribution resembles a bell curve. If we take a point, say D1, on the x-axis and find the corresponding value on the bell curve, we get the height of the distribution at that D1 value. The standard normal cumulative distribution function, n of D1, is given by the integral from negative infinity to D1 of the standard normal density function. It can be visualized as the area under the bell curve up to the point D1. Notice how this probability is multiplied by the stock price in the call price formula. The formula uses volatility, time, and interest rate to find the extrinsic value portion of the call. We will discuss the influence of D1 and what D1 represents in the upcoming slides. D1 is like a measuring tool we use to estimate the likelihood of something happening, in this case, whether or not an option will make money. In the formula, natural log of S over K is basically asking the question, 
right now, is the stock's price more or less than what I'd agreed to buy or sell it for when the option expires? R plus sigma squared by 2 times T is like looking into a crystal ball to estimate how the stock's price could change over the lifespan of the option. It's taking into account things like the interest you could have earned if you'd put your money in a bank instead, R, and how wild the stock's price swings could be, sigma. Sigma times square root of, T, is acknowledging that there's uncertainty in our crystal ball forecast. The longer we have to wait for the option to expire, and the wilder the stock's price swings, the fuzzier our forecast gets. The entire formula, then, is like saying, Given how the stock's price compares to my agreed price right now, and taking into account my crystal ball forecast and how fuzzy that forecast is, how likely is it that I'll make money from this option? The D2 term in the formula is used when determining the probability that an option will be exercised at expiration, given the current state of the market. This is sometimes referred to as the risk-adjusted probability. The subtraction of sigma times square root of t from d1 to obtain d2 essentially adjusts for the volatility risk of the underlying asset over the remaining life of the option. Here's why. Sigma times square root of t represents the expected change in the price of the underlying asset over the remaining life of the option due to its volatility. Essentially, it represents a one standard deviation range for the price of the underlying asset at option expiration. Subtracting this from D1 then adjusts the calculated probability, D1, for this expected price change. Essentially, it reduces the calculated probability by the likelihood that the price of the underlying asset will move outside the one standard deviation range by expiration due to its volatility. Therefore, D2 is essentially a risk-adjusted probability. It's the probability that the option will be exercised but adjusted downwards to account for the volatility risk of the underlying asset. It's a more conservative estimate, which makes sense when pricing something like an option where the seller is taking on risk. Let's consider a decrease in the stock price from 120 to 110. When the stock price decreases to 110, the value of D1 and D2 will decrease, since the stock price is a part of the calculation for D1 and D2. This, in turn, will affect N of D1 and N of D2, which are the areas under the standard normal distribution curve up to the points D1 and D2 respectively. In the scenario where the stock price is below the strike price, i.e., the option is out of the money or OTM, indeed, the values of D1 and D2 can become negative. Let's see how this affects our call option price. The D1 and D2 parameters in the Black Skulls Merton model are derived from several factors, including the current stock price, the strike price, the risk-free interest rate, the time until expiration, and the volatility of the stock. When the stock price is below the strike price, D1 and D2 can become negative because their calculation involves the natural logarithm of the ratio of the stock price to the strike price. When D1 and D2 are negative, the areas under the standard normal distribution curve to the left of these points i.e., n of d1 and n of d2, represent probabilities less than 0.5. This suggests that there is less than a 50% chance that the option will be exercised profitably, 
which makes sense because the option is currently OTM. Moving to the next slide, let's discuss how the expiration date of the option affects its price. In the black skulls merton formula, the time to expiration, represented as T, plays a significant role. This factor is in the numerator of the calculation for D1. So, when the time to expiration or T increases, the value of D1 also sees an upward trend. The impact this has on the option price comes from the components in the formula, the product of stock price and N of D1, represented as S times N of D1 and the product of strike price, exponential of negative R times T and N of D2, represented as K times E raised to negative R times T, multiplied by N of D2. With an expanded D1, we have a larger N of D1, increasing the probability that the option will finish in the money or ITM. This in effect elevates the expected future value of owning the stock, represented as S times N of D1, thereby pushing up the overall option price. The term K times E raised to negative R times T times N of D2 also sees a rise because the escalated D1 usually leads to an increased D2, thus leading to a higher N of D2. This in turn raises the expected present value of the future cost to exercise the option. To summarize, as time to expiration amplifies, given all other things remain equal, both components of the option price usually increase. This results in the extrinsic value of the option being larger for a longer-term option compared to a short-term option. This phenomenon, generally known as time value of options, is a crucial concept in understanding options pricing. Let's now examine an example of a reverse calendar spread strategy using call options. Imagine we're in an earnings season and you anticipate a significant move in the underlying stock price, either upward or downward. You also expect a concurrent increase in implied volatility before earnings and subsequent implied volatility drop. This forecast is uncertain meaning the stock price could swing in either direction. This situation is ideal for setting up a reverse calendar spread. A drop in IV after the earnings announcement is beneficial. This is because the long-term call option you sold, short call position, will decrease in value, potentially allowing you to close the position for less than the premium you initially received, resulting in a net profit. In a reverse call calendar strategy, we begin by purchasing a near-term call option and selling a far-term call option. At this point in time, as shown on the screen, the near-term call option has expired, leaving us with the far-term call option which we sold and which still holds extrinsic value. The combined payoff of this strategy resembles a straddle, but with a curve, indicating potential profits from significant moves in the stock price in either direction. The risk here lies in the stock price remaining stagnant or the implied volatility, IV, not increasing as expected. Now, it's important to understand the role of implied volatility in our strategy. After earnings announcements, IV tends to decrease. This drop in IV reduces the extrinsic value of the options, which could potentially benefit us. 
The far term core option that we sold might lose its extrinsic value, allowing us to buy it back at a lower price to close the position, possibly resulting in a net profit. However, there's a key risk to be aware of. Assignment. If the stock price rises significantly, the holder of the far term call option that we sold might choose to exercise the option. If we don't own the underlying stock, we'd be forced to purchase it at the current market price to fulfill our obligation, which could result in significant losses. As always, careful monitoring of market conditions and proactive adjustments of your position are critical in managing these risks. In this slide, you are seeing a screenshot of a reverse calendar trade executed on the Interactive Brokers platform. We will delve deeper into the details of this setup in our follow-up video, where we'll further discuss the strategy, parameters, potential adjustments, and more. This will help you gain a comprehensive understanding of the reverse calendar spread strategy and how it operates in real-world market conditions. If you found this content helpful, please make sure to like the video and subscribe to our channel. If you'd like to dive deeper and explore this strategy in an interactive manner, check out the website options.21ifm.com. Here you'll find an interactive version of this explainer, allowing you to manipulate parameters and visualize the impact on the strategy's payoff. This hands-on experience can significantly enhance your understanding of the reverse calendar spread strategy.